Barack Obama used to say that too. He said, there are three things you can focus on, the mission, personal grievance, uh, or personal ambition. Focus mm -hmm. on the mission because it's the best way to solve the other two. And that's what always comes back to my mind when there's adversity. I just think, okay, I'm getting pretty emotional here and, and, uh, and I don't like it. Um, I just got to focus on the mission. Trying to influence people to change dietary patterns that have been ingrained for generations can seem at times impossible. And often the information out there about diet and health can be confusing and scary. However, our guest today, Chris McCaskill, has come to the rescue. He is the very likable geophysicist and founder of the photography sharing site SmugMug and the creator of the very popular YouTube channel, Plant Chompers. At Plant Chompers, he offers entertaining but science-based content delivered with wit and verve on the benefits of a plant-dominant diet. He debunks popular myths while exposing marketing tactics that encourage unhealthy eating habits. The videos really are terrific. They're uplifting, and I find that if I watch one, I can't help but watch more. From experiencing homelessness on the streets of Oakland as a child, to graduating from Stanford, to working alongside the legendary Steve Jobs, we are excited to discuss how Chris overcame adversity and charted his own unique path to success and what he has learned from working on plant shoppers. So buckle up, folks, because we do have a riveting material to get to today. Welcome, welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. What a great intro. <clears throat> uh, well, I didn't, I don't even think I mentioned your TED Talk. But you've done a, a, a really outstanding TEDx talk that that people must go listen to. Your difference can be your superpower is the title of it. And in that talk, you you share about your childhood and your mother's schizophrenia. I think that's a good place to start because it's it's more at the beginning uh, than 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 the middle of your life, yeah. which we're going to get into. But t tell us how that affected your life as you were growing and then how it affects your life today. Well, it's funny because I just watched the movie Oppenheimer on the big screen and 70 millimeter and so on. And, um, and whenever I see a movie like that, I think, Oh my gosh. Um, it just brings back memories of my own childhood because my mom mm -hmm. was model gorgeous, very smart. She got a master's degree in organic chemistry from Cornell. And then she got caught up in the McCarthy area and I got scared. And I guess people who are predisposed to schizophrenia and there can be a trigger or something. She'd gone through World War II where her husband, my dad, you know, was on a destroyer in the North Atlantic for four years. And that was scary. Okay. And she descended into schizophrenia, started smoking and hiding in the bathroom and thinking the communists were bugging our telephone lines and so on. Mm. And she left my dad and uh, took me um, and, um, and, moved in with my grandparents. And we lived a pretty good life with my grandparents, but eventually she had to be confined to an institution. It was called an insane asylum at the day in the day yeah. in Pittsburgh. And so I lived with my grandparents for seven years and I got to visit my mom every Saturday. Um, and we had a mom, mom and I had a great relationship. And then somehow she drove an old car to California. I don't know how she got out. I don't know how she made the drive. I don't know why she went to California. Maybe the liberal <clears throat> mental illness laws in California, where you can't be detained against your will for more than 72 hours if you don't pose a threat to society. Uh, I don't know, but she sent a telegram to my grandparents in 1960 saying, send Christopher. <laughs> and they did. They bought me a suit to fly on a TWA jet connection in Chicago. The, the stewardesses, as they were called, were wonderful. And they pinned airplane thingies on my chest and I got to sit in the cockpit with the pilots and then I got to San Francisco and she forgot to pick me up and I was just there in San Francisco as a seven-year-old sobbing you know but the you know the flight attendants were so nice they took me to the big office and they kept saying Miriam McCaskill please call a white courtesy telephone we have your son and um and somehow after I don't know how long um, of sobbing, my dad picked me up and took me to this old apartment in East Oakland. Um, and I was afraid of my dad. I'd only met him once or twice before. Mm -hmm. He was a big, deep voiced, strong ex heavyweight boxer, golden glove boxer, and a very disciplinarian. 
And, um, and I started my life in Oakland with my mom. And it was scary. We couldn't have a telephone because she thought the communists would get us. She was terrified they would steal me. So I got to go to at least part of second grade. And then she pulled me out of school and told me if the truant officer, which is supposedly a guy who patrols around for kids who are not going to school, if he ever catches me playing hooky, which is, means not going to school, I'll go to San Quentin for life. And Jeez. she became, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know what that was, but it was it sounded <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> And um, so uh, she she drank, she became alcoholic, schizophrenics often get into substance abuse. She became alcoholic and smoked a lot. And um, so the $250 a month alimony didn't pay our rent. And so we ended up homeless. And that would have been through at least third and fourth grade and part of fifth. And so we ate what I shoplifted sometimes uh, out of garbage cans. Um, on the street, you know, under freeway overpasses and railroad cars and, you know, things like that. And you wouldn't think it could happen to a child, but I was so terrified of being caught by the truant officer that no one was going to find me. And um, and so that went on until I stole a sweater for her for Christmas at a department store in, East, in, in downtown Oakland, and I got caught and put in juvenile hall and couldn't get out and had to face the judge and Oh my gosh, it was terrifying. And I wouldn't identify myself because then they would find out that I was homeless and or that I'd been playing hooky. And then I would go to San Quentin, which was much worse than Juvenile Hall. And in Juvenile Hall, you know, you got three meals a day. You got yeah. two hamburgers and all the French fries you could eat. You know, it was amazing. Um, so it wasn't so bad, um, except I was terrified. And they gave me lots of books to read. So there was that. And then eventually my father somehow got custody of me. I thought he was living, I didn't know where, um, but he was living in Arinda just over the hills. And so I started sixth grade as a white kid who hadn't really met any other white kids. We had a Japanese kid who played when we were terrible with him because you were in the day with Japanese yeah. boys. All my friends were black and I had an East Oakland black accent. And I went with all these white kids in upper middle class and Arinda, and of course, getting adjusted to that was impossible. And I wouldn't admit to anybody that I missed school, not my dad or anybody else. They put my mom in an institution. They found her and put her in an institution. And um, and I got to visit her again on Saturdays, every Saturday. And um, but I couldn't understand anything in school. I you know times tables. What were those kids thinking? You know, and diagramming sentences and all that. So yeah. one day I just ran out of the classroom, hidden a trainer in a drainage culvert and hoped the, the principal wouldn't call my dad and tell him I played hooky that day because he, he would take the belt on me. And I decided to run away, go to Oakland. I could go over the hills and I knew no one would ever find me. No one. The only worry was my mom would think the communists got me. And but I just decided to drop by my home. I don't know why. And just tap on the door and see if my dad was going to beat me. I knew I could outrun him. And uh, and my stepmom answered the door. And she just knelt down and hugged me while I sobbed. And she didn't ask me any questions. So they put me in slow learning classes. They decided I was retarded, which was the term they used in the day. Mm -hmm. and, and I just went into remedial learning under the care of angels in the form of teachers for yeah. years. And they turn my life around and I'd give anything to go back and tell them and hug them. And you must feel the same Dotsy after all the background you've had with that. Did I heard about your TEDx talk. So many, the, the, so many of them are not with us anymore, but I, yes, yeah. I would give anything as well. You, you had really, um, your, you also got your IQ test and it was very low. Below so I <laughs> imagine that's not, you're not a fan of people getting those, but um, you made it to Stanford, yeah, which I, I mentioned in the Miracle. intro. So, well, wow. I mean, maybe yes, but I'm imagining it at, at some point you started, you know, liking learning uh, and, and worked really hard. Yeah. So the thing was my mom had, claimed that she memorized Shakespeare. She had a minor in English. And wow. I don't know how anybody could do that, but my mom had a photographic memory. And so she would repeat it on the streets of Oakland, drunk, screaming, and I would be a block behind her, embarrassed, but I couldn't lose contact with mm -hmm. her because, you know, so I just learned to detest Shakespeare. Oh, I can't tell you how it makes me nauseous just to think about it. Oh. And so 
when I got into junior into high school, they the English classes they would bring out Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, and and I just couldn't be in the classroom, couldn't hear it, and I just uh, I could just couldn't do it. And I had met a science teacher when I was a freshman who had his face completely scarred from an accident. He was a chemistry former chemistry professor and had a chemical accident. <clears throat> so all the kids made fun of him, but he and I bonded and he taught me so much about science and I loved it. Um, but I just couldn't pass my English classes because of the whole Shakespeare thing. So I did really well in all my classes. I, you know, I had motivation because I was the retard and I wanted to get, over, you know, prove people wrong, but I, I could just couldn't with English. So the UC system, it requires you to not have less than a C and I had D's in English. So they allowed me in on condition that I passed bonehead English, English 1A non-credit course. And they brought out Shakespeare. So quarter number oh. one, I, I got an F and quarter number two, I got an F. So they let me repeat it. Pass, no pass from UC Berkeley. Everyone passes. I failed. And I got expelled from UC Santa Barbara. And I had A's and everything else, computer science and math and physics and everything else. And I was so angry. I just, I don't really get angry very often, but I was, I was pissed. And so I decided I would never step on another college campus as long as I lived. Just, mm. you know, and I, and I still was unable to tell anybody about my past. It was just too hard. It was too humiliating. And I was too afraid that what if they found out I missed all those years of school? Maybe there's some law. And um, I drove to this summer camp where I was going to be a counselor and fell in love with a girl there just instantly. And like you, Dotsie, I was training for the Olympics to on whitewater kayaking on the Kern River in Southern California. Oh, wow. And I'd built up some upper body mass and that you needed for whitewater kayaking and the whole thing. I was, And I got there and I just lost my appetite because I was so in love with this girl. I just could hardly breathe. And uh, <laughs> And then I found out, unfortunately, that she had graduated from college already. She was two years older than me, and it was Phi Kappa Phi, and that sounded fancy. And mm -hmm. I was a complete flop out, so I just thought this would never work. And somehow that girl, who's my wife of 49 years, uh, <laughs> convinced me, she's going to walk in here in a minute, uh, convinced me to, to um, go back to college on a non-matriculated basis. And so I did. She said she would tutor me in English, but I couldn't face Shakespeare. So she got me in technical writing class, anything that didn't have Shakespeare. And I did okay mm. there. And then one thing happened, I know I'm going on too long, but uh, one thing happened. They had a professor of higher education, Paul Duncombe. He was from USC. And he they had power lecture series every month. And I went to them from very accomplished people. Um, John Wooden, the coach of UCLA's basketball and so on. So this guy gave a talk called Learning is Delightful. And somewhere during the talk, he, you know, pointed his finger and very loudly said, the IQ test is the biggest fraud that's ever been perpetrated on the American public. It measures interest and exposure, and that's all it measures. And I just went electric. I mean, every hair stood on end. I used to, I used to have hair to stand on end. And, and the, uh, he said, if you want to graduate in the top 2% of your class, I promise you can do it, whoever you are doesn't matter. Just spend four hours a day at the same time, same place every day. Don't eat there. Don't get distracted by anything. We didn't have smartphones, no televisions, no nothing, no snacking, just focus. And you will get into this zone uh, six days a week. And that's what I did. And, and I got straight A's at University of Utah and my professors loved me and they gave me a recommendation to go to Stanford and I got a full scholarship. I couldn't, could not believe it. When I got that letter from Stanford, I couldn't open it because I was so afraid of what it would say. And so I held it up to the light and I let it sit on my windowsill for two days, torturing me. And <sighs> finally, finally, I got the courage to open it to the light. And the first three words I could see through the envelope were, we are pleased. <laughs> and that yes. changed my life yes. and just changed everything. How does your child, I, I hear the emotion in you as you tell that story still. How has it affected you today? What, how are you different because, and I'm sure you are, of course, we're all shaped by our, our past, but how are you, do you feel different because of your childhood? Going back to your difference can be your superpower. Where are your superpowers yeah. from this? 
Well, uh, there are two things that I think about all the time. Uh, one is how much I appreciate just being here, just being alive and being get, getting the charmed life that I've been able to have. Uh, and I think about it every time I watch the news or, you know, and think about all the people who didn't get all the breaks that I did, didn't have all the angels in their past. Um, so I think about that a lot. And if I ever get an opportunity to help somebody like I'm doing it with a couple of people now who are also in unfortunate circumstances, I try my best to help them. So it gives you some sense of empathy and understanding for people in hard situations. And it gives you a real sense of determination because it took hella determination to get out of there. And I, you know, Dotsie's comment, a lot of those people have passed. A lot of my friends, whatever became of all my friends in East Oakland, you know, that were black and in the 60s uh, and poor, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but it probably for a lot of them wasn't good. I'm wondering what you uh, say to those people that are listening to this who feel like they want to achieve something specific. They might have it in the back of their mind or in the middle of their mind, but they can't move it to the front to, to take action who feel like they don't belong, don't deserve, even feel like they should be somebody else, but they, they want to accomplish a thing or many things. Cause I can only imagine that you've given advice in this area before. What do you say to people? Well, the funny thing is another life-changing experience was going to work for Steve Jobs um, mm -hmm. because he was an, I mean, there were 7 billion people on planet earth and there was only one Steve Jobs. He was one of a kind and he had so many weaknesses and so much emotion and so much, you know, he could not abide anything that was not perfection. And yet he didn't have a degree. He had lots of failure in his life. He had so much trouble containing his emotions and he would have these vendettas and so on. Uh, but mm -hmm. the passion that drove him was, was the thing that made the difference. He found what he loved and just couldn't let it go. And he said that in his commencement speech. That's one of the things I would say is go watch that commencement speech That's that he gave mm -hmm. at Stanford. Mm -hmm. How Steve Jobs ever got selected drop college dropout ever got selected to give a, the commencement of speech at Stanford. I'll never know. Um, but he did it and he wrote it himself. He didn't have anybody else write it on the back of an envelope. And, um, uh, and he gave it from the heart. I didn't expect him to do that. And, and he said, you just have to find what you love that gives you purpose. Mm. And in fact, there's a, there's a, um, a health symposium at Stanford every year for the public. They do it in big tents called Health Matters. And the two of you would love it because Christopher Gardner, who's, uh, I think he's vegan, uh, is a nutrition professor there of great prominence. And um, he's led the School of Medicine to adopt a, a philosophy of, which I think Harvard is where and all the food guides in the world are, but make 75% of your plate at least whole plant foods and uh, the more is better. And if you take it all the way up to vegetarian and vegan, it's still super healthy, maybe the healthiest. And um, so at that uh, symposium, there was a professor of gerontology, Deborah um, AA, uh, I can't remember her last name, who was asked by the audience, what is the number one thing you can do for health and long life? And without hesitation, she said, oh, you're going to expect me to say nutrition or sleep or exercise or something like that. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say sense of purpose. That's the number one thing. And I thought, wow. So there you go. Mm. Find your sense of purpose. The other thing to do is watch that um, that ad that Steve helped make, um, The Crazy Ones. <laughs> you can find it on YouTube. Um, only people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world do. When I was reading and listening to your interviews and reading about you, there were several instances where you said you ran away. And you mentioned that actually in what, talking to us too, that you ran away. It seemed like there were several instances where you literally ran from your fear, physically ran from emotional fear and everything. And I was curious mm -hmm. how, why you think you chose that way to deal with issues and what do you do now when you're afraid and how do you, how do oh, you come funny. now instead of running? 
Maybe you're a runner uh, too, because I know you're a triathlete. I'm a runner. But... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, no. Well, you did Kona in 1997, oh, yeah. right? The World Championships. I don't know how you ran in that heat. Oh my uh, gosh. I, I did do that. Yes, of course I know you're a runner because a lot of times you're running or walking when you're, yeah. when you're um, doing your own videos. But anyway, yeah. so what? how do you deal with your emotional fears now? Well, the funny thing is, you know, on the streets of Oakland, running was survival. When I shoplifted that sweater, at, it was on the fourth floor of Ruzek and then a, a clerk noticed that I had it in my jacket and a sleeve had fallen out of my jacket as I was getting on the elevator. So I, I knew that she saw me and she picked up the phone to call security. So I got out on the second floor and we used to have fire escapes and you could run out a window and jump off these fire escapes down to the sidewalk. I was pretty practiced at this. And, um, and I don't know where the sweater went, but I decided to run and a detective from the store started chasing me and he had a suit on and but he was an adult and I was a uh, fifth grader. And, um, and I thought I could outrun anybody. Um, and, but this guy, <laughs> he was pretty fast. So we ran into another department store. I went down in the basement where the women's clothing was and tried to hide around things. And he managed to flush me out of there. And we ran all the way to Lake Merritt. And I finally decided I, I'm I'm dying here. He's got me. And so he caught me by the shoulders, turned me to the cement building and kept slamming me against the building and said, you little shit. And it was, I hope I can say that on your podcast. And, um, uh, and then when I saw his chest heaving like that, I thought, I got to kept running a little longer. He was almost out of gas. Um, but anyway, that, that was the survival mechanism. So I just, you know, my mom used to run away from not physically, but she, you know, if there was a bad situation for her, she'd figure out how to get away from it. And it's just always been my instinct to quit a job or, you know, get out of a situation if I just can't deal with it. And I've tried to sort of outgrow that. Um, and and here's he, here's how I've tried to do it. I think one of the greatest tutorials I've ever heard about was the one given to Steve Jobs. And I think it was by Ed Catmull. I think Ed Catmull did it. He was the CEO of Pixar. And in the day at Next, and Next wasn't doing well, and neither was Pixar. And Steve was running lower on money. And Steve had all these vendettas and people he wouldn't forgive. And some of them were very talented people who would come to him with things he needed to hear, but he didn't want to hear them so badly that they, you know, their relationship would fall apart. And one of those was a guy by the name of Mike Slade, who was very important to Steve. He was my boss. He was the VP of marketing. And uh, they parted. And then Ed Catmull came down and said, Steve, you have to give it up. Just focus on the mission. And don't focus on personal grievance, personal ambition. Just focus on the mission. That's what you're really passionate about. And I noticed Barack Obama used to say that too. He said, there are three things you can focus on. The mission, personal grievance. Uh, or personal ambition, focus mm -hmm. on the mission, because it's the best way to solve the other two. And that's what always comes back to my mind when there's adversity, I just think, okay, I'm getting pretty emotional here. And, and, um, and I don't like it. Um, I just got to focus on the mission. And that's what I do in my episodes when somebody comes after me, and I just posted one where somebody came after me for what I was saying. And I just thought, no, I'm just going to focus on the mission. I'm not going to take it personally. It's a lot easier said than done. We can't uh, skip over that as a teenager, uh, we learned that you caddied for Jack LaLanne, who's definitely the the OG vegan veg guy, always, always encouraging more fruits and more veggies. Um, and this ties into when you're working for Steve Jobs at Next and you found out you were overweight high cholesterol, you start training for triathlons. So you caddy for Jack Lane. What did you think at the time when he was saying maybe not so many, not eating so many animals is a good idea and more fruits and veggies. And then did his voice come back into your head when you started on your, your journey to lose weight? Yeah. It comes back to my head all the time. In fact, I have right here on my desk, uh, his, one of his many books celebrating 90 years this was the Jack LaLanne I knew. I mean, he was the Arnold Schwarzenegger of his day. He was, I think that was, he was 40 when this photo was taken. Um, can you imagine being a kid from Oakland? Uh, my dad wouldn't, 
give me an allowance or anything. So I had to go earn my own money for, for clothes and things. And right. so I got this job as a caddy at Arinda Country Club. And Arinda Country Club has a very high-end clientele. And I started doing it when I was 14. You could do it in those days. And um, somewhere along the line, the caddy master who liked me <laughs> put me in a, a foursome where I caddied for two people. Jack Belaine was one who was very famous in the day. He had that TV show and you know, right. a Hollywood star, the whole thing. And Rick Barry, who was the NBA's most valuable player in, in the, and they won the national championship. And so there's six, seven Rick Barry uh, skinny and Jack Lane who's super muscular and I'm catting from both. And Rick never talked to me, but Jack took an interest in it. He's the nicest guy. And he took an interest in me and he caught me once drinking an orange soda. I, why won't, when I drink an orange soda, every kid drank orange soda. And, uh, and he told me to pour it out and get rid of it and drink water instead. And then he just started, you know, every time I'd caddy for him, he'd tell me something new about nutrition. There wasn't that much to know, but, um, right. <laughs> but he, he would say, Chris, if it came from a cow or a pig, don't eat it. <laughs> and he'd say, I want you to eat five fruits and 10 vegetables every day. I mean, it's like, come on. And he used to say, if you stop eating it, you won't miss it. And it's like, mm. no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I was caught in this dispute because my father was on all, it, all there were lo lots of popular low carb diets in the sixties that preceded the Atkins diet. The Atkins diet was just more marketing of the same old diet, um, except mm -hmm. he called it revolutionary and he was pretty good at marketing it. So we had steak on the grill every night and we had eggs for breakfast and my dad was all about protein and and mm -hmm. no starch. Um, you couldn't have starch, so uh, which was carbs. So I would tell that to Jack, and he would tell me why he didn't think that was right. So I would tell that to my dad, and he would <laughs> he would say, "Well, Jack eats fish and chicken and egg whites, and he exercises so much, and maybe he's got genetics. He can get over eating the starch, you know." But listen, Jack is not mm. a doctor and he's not a scientist. You got to listen to doctors and scientists. Well, that had weight on me because I thought, oh, yeah, that could be true. He's a gym rat, as my dad called him, you know? So yeah, maybe. So I kind of forgot about Jack for years. And then when I was at Stanford and was deeply into science, <laughs> I, a lot of what Jack said came back. And my dad, you know, had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, gout, um, overweight, and he died of a massive heart attack when he was 70, mm. as happened to my sister at 70, my age. So mm. I guess I'm done. And um, so I began to pay more attention to Jack and his background uh, and noticed that he hung out with a lot of nutrition scientists, that his mother had been Seventh-day Adventist. And so he had kind of a um, predisposition uh, towards vegetarianism. And a lot of the scientists that he was listening to were Adventist scientists. They have a very respected school of nutrition. And come on, they're the longest lived population in the world, as far as I can tell, right here in the United States, even though they're diverse, they're 35% black and 17% Hispanic and 40% of them live in high mortality states in the South. Of all the populations in the world, you'd least expect to be the longest lived population in the world. It would be right here in the United States with mm -hmm. that diverse of a population, not necessarily high income either. So they have lots of risk factors. But, you know, I did an episode about why Americans don't live as long as other rich countries. Uh, mm -hmm. The Asian Americans in America do. They outlive white Americans by five or six years. But the Adventists outlive white Americans by nine years and black Americans by a whole lot more than that. Wow. So I think that was very influential on Jack. And so then I got really interested in the science. And as you've seen in my episodes, um, science is, is so clear. I mean, populations all over the world, they're, you know, they're piling on the whole plant foods, beans and rice and veggies and fruit and, you know, mm -hmm. nuts. And, you know, maybe a little bit of animal food is fine, especially if it's fish, but not a lot. And especially if it's red meat. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. 
We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page. That's Switch, the number four, and then Good. And then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. So you got overweight when you were working so many, you know, desk jobs for people like Steve uh, Jobs and you also had very high cholesterol. So you started exercising a lot, but your cholesterol still remained high. Um, and that your doctor said, well, just, you should take these drugs. Um, what, what made you, was that the, the catalyst you realized, oh, I can't out exercise my, my, uh, this, this high cholesterol, or did you just think, oh, well, you know, it's in my family. What, what were you, what was your reaction? You know, I had got up to 228 pounds. I'm 6'4". A, a lot of that was working out in the gym. I was weightlifting a lot, three days a week. Mm -hmm. um, my exercise in the day was an hour of weights uh, every other day and 30 minutes as fast as I could go on the Stairmaster. But but I also was too heavy. Um, I had a little bit of visceral fat and so on. And my cholesterol, I, I guess I'm borderline... Um, um, hypercholesterolemia um as my ldl gets up to about 200 if i eat what i thought was a fairly healthy diet you know mediterranean diet with olive oil and a lot of fish but you know also some indulgence i was eating indulgences like cookies and cake at my kids birthday parties and things like that so anyway 228 pounds and high cholesterol so um I decided I was 47. I decided, you know what? I'm going to do an Ironman when I'm 50. And mm -hmm. I hired a coach <laughs> and you know, the drill. He said, well, your training weight should really be 195 and your a race weight for the year should be 185. And if you're ever going to run a marathon, it's got to be a lot less than that. Um, and it's like, Oh, Oof. so that's, so, that's, that's, that's lean at six, four. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, he, th this guy, Reno Starat, he had run sub 245 marathons at Boston over five decades. His best was a 212. And he mm. was 130 at 6'1. <laughs> and when Whoa. I got down, to, yeah. And when I got oh. down to 175 uh, pounds, and I, I was 50 something and I ran a 345 marathon, I think. And he ran less than a 245 marathon. Uh, he, I said, how come you're that much faster than me? And uh, he said, it's weight. It's weight. You're 40 pounds overweight, at least <laughs> at 175. And he God. says, I, ra I race at 125. He said, there's, you know, there's 50 pounds. There's 50 minutes right there. So. Um, <laughs> well, I so guess it's like, whatever your priorities are, but you weren't a professional athlete. So no. I, I read that you felt you were too thin at 175. Well, people said so. My face was starting to get drawn and yeah. they would say, eat a sandwich. This vegan diet is destroying you. Look what you're wasting away. Uh -huh. um, you didn't look good. So anyway, I was training at 195 and at 50, age 50, um, I did a race at 185, my first Ironman. And then I had my blood test and my cholesterol had not budged. Nothing had changed. The LDL was pegged where it was before. And it's like, what? How? how is that even possible? And I went back to my doctor, who's still my doctor today. He's become vegan. I hope that I helped influence that. And he got certified by the Colin Campbell, you know, lifestyle courses and everything. Um, he, um, uh, he said, it's genetic. You can't outrun your genes. I'm sorry. Um, you're going to have to be on statins. So I um, went back and that's when I got interested in Caldwell Esselstyn, you know, his book. Um, and um, Joel Furman and, and all the rest. Um, 
So I, I began to be more strict in my diet and be very ve vegan, mm -hmm. um, but also no indulgences at all. And I cut out the oils just because I, I'd heard enough from them and I thought they're kind of empty calories, no protein or whatever. In the day, anyway, I cut them out. And my LDL dropped from 200 to 120. Well, 120 is a lot better. Um, but that's as low as I could get it, you know, via weight and diet and everything. I tried everything. I think I didn't keep perfect food logs, but I did weigh my food and kept some food logs. And it felt that if I did have some oils, the polyunsaturates were a little better at keeping my LDL down than the monounsaturates were like olive oil. And I think science has kind of confirmed that. So 120 is as low as, as it goes, but to go from 200 to 120 LDL was a big accomplishment just by diet. I mean, statin, can a statin do that? I don't know if it can go quite that far. So yeah. my husband has pepper cholesterolemia too. Um, oh, really? He's a half Asian descent and it's very common. Mm. Uh, it's, mm. it's, he's Filipino and the, and it's very common and, and, and same, same thing. He, he, but he's been able to really manage it with a diet and get his statin down to five milligrams a day, mm. because, you know, mm. normally they put yeah. people on 20, 25 yeah. milligrams. So, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a genetic bummer for sure, yeah. because it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's always has to be managed. But so what, what does a typical day look like now in, in, uh, on your plate? I mean, you've made, you've mm -hmm. made a complete and total radical shift. You say yeah. that you're plant, you're plant dominant. <laughs> I like that versus uh, no. plant-based. I'm plant-based. Um, um, I, I recommend plant dominant diets like the Mediterranean yeah. diet often to people, because I just think it's, easier Oh, that's what actually. you call the, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I myself Suggest are vegan and, and I often say right. I have six reasons for being vegan. And then they ask what they are. And I rattle off like seven or eight, depending on how many I can remember. Um, but health is, is one of. So okay. That the Mediterranean diet might be the healthiest, even though it contains ammo products, but you, you yourself are vegan. You know, I'm not sure anyone really knows like Walter Longo is probably the most qualified to speak on this. He's a uh, longevity researcher and of Italian descent and a professor at USC. And he's done a lot of studies on it. He, uh, he thinks whole plant um, dominant diets with a small portion of fish twice a week is probably the healthiest. Um, mm -hmm. So I would worry a little bit about the no fish part of it. Um, and the seventh day Adventist studies are all very clear that the vegans have the best BMIs, lowest chance of diabetes and everything else. But the pescatarians live about the same amount of time. So the mm -hmm. vegans are healthier during their life, but they don't live longer than pescatarian. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't think I mean, so. it's important, I think, to like also look at it. What what is it in the fish? Right. And and it, it it's probably the, the really high concentrations of omega threes. And where can we get that source possibly yeah. from what the, where the fish get the source uh, right from the sea? So, uh, but you know, I have a, uh, a good friend who's a, a PhD and, and, um, is a professor of diet disease and exercise at Chapman university. And he, uh, has gone through a, um, traumatic brain injury. Uh, it, it mm -hmm. happened about two years ago, uh, from a heart attack on a bike where he has the mm -hmm. athlete's heart and AFib combination. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's, and then he had a heart attack and was out cold and fell and got the um, brain injury, but he's in a brain injury support group, uh, a very large one. And people are, are in the support group from all over the world and have had brain injuries for, uh, you know, 20 and 30 years. These people have, <clears throat> and so he is healing faster than many of them who have been in this group for 20 years and have, you know, their brain injury was 20, 25 years ago. And so they, they asked him to do a presentation on, diet, um, to, to, to understand is you know, really the only difference that, and he's, he, he exercises every day. And as I've learned from him, when you have a, a brain injury, especially in the beginning, it is, it's, it's, it's so depressive that it is really difficult to even walk out the front door and to even go on a walk. I mean, I saw him in such a dark space and this is somebody who's exercised literally every day since he was five years old. So besides the exercise, it's his diet that's the different. And he follows 
a strict whole food plant-based diet. Like he eats like a, a literal monk. Um, what what we've seen him, um, but he puts a little bit of fish in as well. And uh, the the day that I heard him give this, because I was able, lucky enough to be able to come in on Zoom and listen to this presentation that he was giving the group. So much of what we've talked about on this podcast, Alexander, like so many of the stats and so many, um, you know, deep dive into understanding different foods and why they're so powerful. I was speaking at a veg fest in Louisville right after Dr. Kim Williams. So I got to catch the end Mm. of Dr. Kim Williams talks and people were asking a lot about fish because there is, there's quite a, I mean, we have quite a bit of evidence, right. in the Mediterranean diet and that it's, that it's the healthiest. And he said, all of that is fine. And that is that evidence, but the way that we are treating and polluting our oceans, um, we are literally poisoning ourselves if we're eating fish from uh, because there is so much wrong, I guess I'll just say, with the fish, the the, the you know the meat from the fish, the fish from the fish, uh, that it's just downright dangerous at this point to be consuming. So it, that 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 was uh, kind of a like a, a wow moment. I, I don't eat fish, but uh, I, anyway, I went back to Doctor Sternlicht and said, "We you you got to look deeper into this, and I got to get you a you know because he had Ian Williams had some references of the pollution. So I I think you know we're not it's it's it, it, everything's not created equal. Maybe food wise, like it was so many many years ago, with what we're doing to our our planet and our environment. Yeah, you know, I often say about fish, you may be able to eat some kinds of fish now still and help wreck the planet while you do it. <laughs> I'm, you know, being an earth scientist, it's, you know, it's a big, it's a huge worry for me. Um, right. But it, you're not going to be able to do it for much longer. The way we're treating our waterways, you know, all the stuff that's going into the waterways, which goes into the oceans, which goes into the fish, um, you know, so mm-hmm. I think we're left with, do the omega-3 pills work? And I don't know. I mean, there, there are a few Well, there's things. algae too. I mean, the fish eat algae. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have to take a supplement. You can yeah. eat a, a food. Yeah. And, and then there's the ethical part, which is fish feel. Absolutely. Ethical. So there's many. So what I, what I understand from you, Chris, is that you recognize that there might be health benefits to eating fish, but you've chosen not to for Correct. the 10 reasons. <laughs> five to <laughs> Whatever 10 reasons. they are. I like six, even give us six. Give us some six. Of them. Rattle off six. some of them, especially from your earth science background. <laughs> you, you want me to rattle off? Okay. So, health is one. Um, my earth science background, I, you know, I consider the planet as being number two, but it has a lot of things in there. Global warming is one, land and water use, deforestation, pollution. Mm-hmm. So, there's antib- so a third reason would be antibiotic resistance which is mm-hmm. becoming pretty scary. Then there's pathogens. They feed the fish in these, well, you, it ha, it's with meat too, but they feed the fish in these farms with antibiotics. Yeah. And yeah. and chickens and pigs and cows and everything. I mean, it, it, you know, it's a really scary thing in the hospitals to see. And for parents of children, when they get something where an antibiotic can no longer fix it. And a lot of that is because the antibiotics are being given to farm animals. I know about the bioconcentration of like pesticides and so on. So, you know, the cows are fed the the corn um, or grain or whatever. Chickens are fed the corn. And, and there's not as many regulations on spraying those crops for animals. And then they get into the animals and they concentrate in their fat and then we eat their fat. And um, so you think you're doing good by not eating crops that are sprayed, but you actually are just secondhand. So did I go through six re- Oh well, there's the way we treat animals, you know, which is just a horror, horror show. Ezra Klein wrote a, a piece for the New York Times saying future generations will look back in horror at the way we're treating animals. And I, I think he's going to end up like on the right side of history. It's uh, all, all of the facts and the figures and the awareness and the knowledge are one thing. But there's all of that combined sometimes won't change people's minds on eating animals. And a lot of it has to do with marketing, right? And how they, how how they, the industry markets beef and eggs and dairy and how it's been so connected for so long to, um, and sex successfully marketed as man food, you know, this is what the dudes eat, you know, meat, it's what for dinner, it's what for dinner. 
pork, the other white meat. I mean, just really pushing it uh, on us. And, and it's, it's, it's done a number on our psychology. Uh, but you work hard every day to unravel and even unlock, uh, you know, people's obstinance to wanting to just fill their plate with animals. Tell us a, a, a success story. It might be your doctor because I think you have a lot of influence oh, yeah. there, but, but where you had somebody that, that really had, you know, kind of bought, was, was bought and sold by the industry. I know I was for 35 years especially with dairy foods, uh, as an athlete inside the training centers of the Olympic, um, of the Olympics, because they, the dairy was a title sponsor of the U S Olympic team for, for 10 years in my year. So I, 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 I believed all the, all the marketing and all the hype. And I think that's one thing, one of the many things I love about the, the, this, you know, the Gen Z is they, they're way more inquisitive than my generation was, uh, when we just get fed this, this, you know, information, uh, in saying, well, hold on a minute. I want to check into that. I want to look into that. So give us a, give us a, yeah, your favorite success story. Oh, well, you know, change. so the origin of it comes from my earth science background, because we knew in the seventies when I was a graduate student that we were warming the ocean, um, or the, the planet. And we had great scientists, including Carl Sagan and James Hansen, who's head of NASA Goddard Space Institute, uh, testified to Congress in the 80s. And we went through this period of acceptance in the 80s. I mean, even the president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, said anyone who's worried about the greenhouse effect doesn't know the power of the White House effect. But then in the 90s, Exxon and the Koch brothers, both brilliant marketers, started ramping things up and there became some denial. And then for whatever reason, the denial intensified more and more in the 2010s and 2020s. And now I'm reading, there's a Time Magazine article saying, the more evidence comes forth of climate change, the more heated the denial becomes. You would expect the opposite, but it becomes more emotional and more heated. And I think that's where it is today. It's, I think it's the same with food. The, the Cattlemen's Association in America and the Dairy Council are brilliant marketers. They've been brilliant marketers for the whole century. I have this leather-bound book, of course, it had to be leather-bound, on 100 years of success in the, in the cattlemen's industry and how they've done it, how they pick the people who did their PR, often women. They had the most success with women who were mothers and had children that could you know, feed beef to their children. They... You know, the way they marketed beef in Japan, which had a long tradition of of not eating animals on the on the hoof because of their uh, their religion. And they're, you know, getting dairy into the schools and <laughs> those milk ads were amazing. You know, Mark Spitz with his seven gold medals on him with a milk mustache, you know, the whole milk mustache campaign, milk does a body. Oh my gosh, it's they're just so brilliant. And the one thing they could market, at least on, from the beef side, uh, was protein. And so it became the obsession of all of us, you know, athletes and everything else. And strangely enough, for both men and women, because for men, it made them masculine, like hunters of old and so on. And they could get beefy with all that protein. With women, they could get lighter because it suppresses the appetite. <laughs> I don't know. They, they found a marketing for every, you know, demographic. Just absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And I think it's helped by the fact that red meat, once you get used to it it's, and season it right and everything else, the world loves it. It's delicious. And they love bacon too. And they don't love broccoli. So we have a harder message, you know, to pitch than yeah. <laughs> lose, lose yeah. the steaks. They don't like fish, you know, very much. Right. Jim Gaffigan has all these jokes about fish being disgusting. He likes a good right. steak, you know. <laughs> In so. the South, we uh, flavor our broccoli with bacon. So that is yeah. how people people get it down in the South. You know, I learned the last time I was in, in Washington, we were talking about all of these campaigns that you're speaking about of the meat and dairy industry and, and how brilliant they are. And, and, and the farmers pay into uh, these campaigns so they don't have to, they can farm and they don't have to do the marketing themselves. And so they pay into it for the dairy industry. It's known as milk pet. But I learned uh, the last time I was in Washington that that campaign that was pork, the other white meat because we had been obsessed for a while with white whiteness and whitewashing everything. I don't know why it's, you know, like we had made people believe with the chicken and pork that, you know, you we, we want, we want your meat to be white. I don't know why, but can, that can I interrupt campaign. For a second? I, think, yeah. I think I know why it's heme iron. Oh yes. 
heme iron comes from red blood from so it, it's got to have red blood in it to you know to have much heme iron some fish have some some heme iron and pork has some heme iron but the the, the runaway winner in heme iron is is um is beef and the body has right. trouble not absorbing heme iron it's so bioavailable and with men and postmenopausal women, they have no way to get rid of iron. Iron is just not one of those metals you can get rid of mm -hmm. without giving blood. And it's a neurotoxin and a, and an aging, it's a pro-oxidant. So people who eat a lot of red meat get a lot of heme iron and they it's hard for them to make it out of their 70s. They, Correct. They, yes. I just, I think that's giving the, just the general population that they were marketing to a whole ton of credit. Cause I bet you anybody you ask out there in the world, that's believing these commercials, they have no idea what heme iron is, but, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but, but thank you for bringing that up. Cause it's good education. Um, but anyway, the, um, there's two, well, there's probably many types of pigs, but in the food system, there's the very light pink pigs. And then there are, uh, black spotted pigs gray spotted pigs is really what they're um but they look gray with with black spots anyway that marketing initiative put all of the gray spotted pig farmers out of business almost overnight and they had been paying mm. into the all of the marketing campaigns that uh mm. the pork mm. industry was putting out there's no more I didn't know that yeah, I didn't either. I thought it was, I, I thought, oh my gosh, it just shows that, that, that power, right. Of, of, mm. of the marketing of just one sentence, hardly even a, a full sentence, right. Pork, the other white meat. And then they yeah. just, so then when they looked in the grocery store, they were looking for the white meat and not yeah. the gray meat. Um, and there aren't any. Wait, so the, so the pigs with the gray spots had different colored meat. That doesn't, that doesn't really make yeah. sense. Really? No, it was gray. Yeah. Yeah, huh. I saw pictures of it. Wow. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. it was um, right. I know Marty taught me that, Alexandra, because you know Marty. <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, it's just it's ex it's extremely powerful, and I'm glad that, like I said, this generation is asking a lot more questions because we just, um, I mean, we believed I got milk. Uh, we just believed it. I, I was like, oh, okay, I'll just drink a little more milk. It sounds good. It makes know. sense. You know, we, and I didn't, we didn't really even have a lot of milk marketing in our schools to the degree that we just had a, uh, an 18 year old on, on, on the show. And she was talking about how inundated her high school is with the marketing. It's on the morning announcements. There's posters everywhere, right. Uh, at the last bits to, hopefully be able to get the kids to, to drink more milk because 73% of the dairy industry's income comes from federal programs. So wow. if that goes away, they're, they're, they're done overnight. So they are, they are grappling for uh, the, the, the kids to listen, but they're not having much success because that generation is going, well, hold on, let me look into this. Let me ask more questions. Let me see how I feel when I drink it. Let, you know, so it's a positive. There's two questions Dotsie asked that we haven't yet answered because um, we got we got sidestepped. So Dotsie <laughs> asked what you eat in a day and right. uh, and a success story. So let's go to that because I think our listeners really like to hear what someone like you, you said you're 70 now, who Almost. and you're vibrant and excited Almost. about life and so healthy. Yeah. yeah. Been with hypercholesterolemia. <laughs> Um, so mm -hmm. tell us what you and your wife of 49 years, um, what you, what y'all eat. Yeah. So, uh, for breakfast, we, uh, we love oatmeal, of course, everyone says that, and it can be done in so many different ways with all kinds of different fruits and spices. She makes up, uh, a spice, Ceylon cinnamon and just various different spices, kind of like a pumpkin pie spice. Mm. Um, and chia seeds or hemp seeds so that's like every other day and we love tofu scramble beans and tofu and you know onions and all of that stuff is is really great we have grandkids who can whip that up really fast and yeah. um, and they love it and uh, my daughter's raising all of her six children vegan and they become really good cooks and they make a chia pudding that's that's kind of amazing and also we, uh, Tony, my wife is Tony. She makes these two quart bottles of yogurt. We just use Trader Joe's soy milk mm -hmm. and she pours them in the bottle and she has a starter and she puts it in the, 
the slow cooker overnight at 110 degrees or whatever it is. And in the morning we have, we have soy yogurt and it doesn't have any sugar. It doesn't have anything in it. And we're, we're lucky. We live in the Bay area. We have farmer's markets and everything. And, and, you know, we go out and buy berries and all that stuff. And so I just love, you know, berries for breakfast, pouring some, some yogurt over it and, uh, may, and probably put some chia seeds on it and so on. And then uh, Tony or I make a salad every single day and try to have a salad at lunch. But if I'm doing heavier workouts or something, a salad feels kind of light. Um, you know, it's a big salad. You get to eat a lot uh, when you make a salad. <laughs> and, uh, and we, you know, we put things like pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds and all that stuff on it. I don't really put dressing on it. Um, I sometimes sprinkle nooch on it. Your taste buds change and you adapt. A salad sounds terrible, especially without the blue cheese dressing when you're right. when you've been eating rich food. But when you're not eating rich food, I mean, my favorite dressing on my salad is to take a basket of blueberries and dump it over the top of the salad and have this huge salad with carrots and tomatoes and seeds and all kinds of greens thrown in there. So, but Tony also makes up a mixed lentil. I mean, there's like 10 different beans and lentils in there. And I like to add fermented foods to it. I just, for me, you know, I've become... Stefan DNA has this great book called The Hungry Brain. And he says, the best tip for maintaining your weight is to eat simple foods. And I've just become, love simple foods. So those beans, lentil mix, you have a variety of beans. I'll pour kimchi in there or sauerkraut that I get in bulk at Costco. You know, sometimes we'll have rice, you know, to mix the beans in the rice. <laughs> and lately I've been, we get a head of cauliflower and I throw it in the Vitamix and turn it into to rice. So we get beans and rice. And I used to put a lot of salsa in there to spice it up, but I don't so much anymore because it's pretty salty. And then at four o'clock every afternoon, my dog makes sure I do it. We make a green smoothie. I make a green smoothie. And, uh, and you know, that green smoothie has every, the first thing I put in is a mixture of berries from Costco, three berry blend. It's frozen. So I stick that in there. And then I pour some of that yogurt in that, that we have, uh, the mm -hmm. fermented yogurt. And then I'll put in cauliflower and broccoli, not so often cauliflower, but broccoli, all kinds of kales, different varieties of kales, red cabbage, mm. a tablespoon full of ground up chia seeds or uh, uh, flax seeds. And then the question is always the liquid. I don't want to just use a fruit juice that would you know, be like drinking sugar water. So uh, our farmer's markets and uh, a sort of a vegetable stand thing where you buy a lot of stuff from, they have these great juices that have a lot of solids in suspension. You have to shake them up to get the stuff. So I'll sweeten it up a little bit with that and mix it maybe 50-50 with water. I kind of think of fruit juice in there as an indulgence. I'll sometimes put carrot juice in there. And um, does your dog share it with you? Is that why your dog reminds you at four o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> does he lick the uh, blender like I do? <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my, uh, you would get along well with Tony. She, she wishes I wouldn't rinse the blender out and pour it out yeah, that yeah, I would yeah, lick yeah, it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And uh, no, he, we put a carrot in the, I forgot to mention that we put a carrot in there and, and uh, oh. we buy them in bulk at Costco and he eats a carrot. He loves the carrot. And we put a red pepper in there. Um, a part of a red pepper in there and he wants a piece of that and then I pour a little bit of that yogurt out that he he likes to <laughs> so he goes and parks himself there every day at four o'clock it's so and, cute and at 4 15 or so if if I haven't gotten there by then he'll give a yipe or a bark or something um, but this paw clock that's yeah my dog has a paw <laughs> clock too <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah so, religious habits that we do but he's a yellow lab so that's great uh, well, and then you know, for dinner, we try to eat lightly. The thing is that I tend to like to exercise in the evening and that, you know, it gets a, it kind of gets an appetite up. Um, mm -hmm. So when I come back from exercising, I might have one of those bean dishes. Um, I'll eat some bread occasionally. We get this 100% rye sourdough at the farmer's market that I like. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, we buy Ezekiel bread and keep it in the freezer, um, which is a combination of lentils and sprouted, uh, crushed, um, 
grains. Um, yeah. So we like that nut butters, nuts. You know, I really like Costco now has these big bags of mixed nuts that I really like. And, you know, the kind of nutso sort of butters that that mm -hmm. have all kinds of mixed nuts in there. I'll put that on my bread. Mm -hmm. something to satisfy because I, I tend to sometimes I wake up. It doesn't matter what I eat. Sometimes I wake up at two in the morning hungry. <laughs> and I think uh, if I get up and eat something, some nuts, I'm going to gain weight. Um, but on the other hand, I have to lie here for an hour and get over my hunger. And uh, I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> keep it, it on your bedside like table. That's what I do. Oh, you do that? <laughs> yeah. If I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's only if I've just worked out really hard. I mean, it used to happen all the time. I was a professional athlete and I would keep it right oh, on. Yeah. The, yeah. Because then you, once you're up and walking down to the kitchen, but every once in a while, if I've gone three days of training really hard for I, no reason now, just because I felt like it and it's good for my mental health. I'll just keep it. Yeah. I just keep them right on my bedside. Same with me. <laughs> like, like, yeah. Sleep one eating. Thing, <laughs> one thing that satisfies for me is Lara bars, the, the yeah. peanut Lara bars. Nice. They're, those are good. Yeah. I really like them. They're yeah. just 200 calories and they, they really satisfy. So yeah, I'm not sponsored. Before, <laughs> it's okay. If you were, before we go, it. tell us about uh, plant chompers because we want to yeah everybody to go and look at your yeah. very informational but but also entertaining compelling too yeah oh thank you uh, videos. thank you yeah so uh back in the day when we started smug mug which is a, a site for mostly professional photographers there's hundreds of thousands of professional photographers who make their living on smug mug doing everything you can imagine wedding shoots to astronauts who do their you know celestial photography and so on we started a YouTube channel and I just had the best time doing it. We mm -hmm. had a cinematographer who helped. And some of our episodes would get a million views. We get to interview astronauts, Don Pettit, who's become a friend. And um, and then I have this irrational passion for motorcycles, a little less so now than I had. And I just happened to start this motorcycle site, Adventure Rider. It's for, it's like the Jeep of motorcycles. You ride around the world for adventure. You know, they're not Harleys or anything like that. And I started a little YouTube channel for that too. And every episode I'd do would get hundreds of thousands of views. I would just review motorcycles and all these motorcycles would show yeah. up on my driveway from the best manufacturers. Oh, I um, love it. Yeah. yeah. And so I just really liked doing it. And I thought, you know, I'm aging out of motorcycles because one of these days, you know, it's just a matter of time. And, you know, I retired from Smug Mug and left it to my sons. They run it and they don't want dear old dad interfering too much. So I just got thinking, you know, it's been a lifetime passion of both for earth science, for nutrition, mm -hmm. for all these diseases, antibiotic resistance, pathogens, and everything else, the cruelty to animals. I used to do water testing as a geophysicist around some of these animal farms, the chicken farms in the East. It's horrifying, absolutely horrifying. That was in the eighties. It's worse now. And uh, so it's always been a lifelong passion. And I thought, you know what, I probably don't, age out of that unless I start looking terrible on camera and get fat or something. And I really like it. And one of the things that just grips me is among top universities, Harvard, Stanford, and all the rest, among all the food guides around the world with all the top scientists doing those food guides, among all the professional societies, plant dominant diets dominate. Mediterranean, vegan, vegetarian, Asian, the mind diet, the dash diet, they're all plant dominant diets and it's universally accepted. And 90, I don't know, 8% of doctors and things, but on the internet, meat heavy diets completely dominate. Wow. I mean, the, you know, the carnivores and, and low carb dieters, their YouTube channels are getting millions of views. I mean, they're, you know, they outrun us all by 10 to a hundred times and they're not very qualified. So I haven't found any really qualified scientists or doctors in there doing that. I mean, a lot of them have lost their licenses. And so they're doing YouTube videos like Ken Berry and they're making their living out of doing these YouTube videos that have spread so much misinformation. It's just soul destroying. And yet they get, you know, 8 million subscribers, 12 million in the case of Joe Rogan, 2.7 million in the case of Ken Berry. It's like unbelievable. So <clears throat> I decided, you know what? <laughs> you need to put some more accurate information out there in a more entertaining way. Because 
scientists like Walter Willett at, at Harvard School of Public Health, if he's on an episode, it doesn't get more than 3,000 views. I love the guy. He is the most cited scientist in all of medicine, and he's run the Harvard School of Business, or School of Public Health for decades and done some of the most amazing studies. That guy really knows, and his book is airtight. It's flawless. But he gets no views because he's boring and he doesn't want to be exciting. He doesn't want to tell all these stories and be exciting like the two of you are. So I decided, well, I got some views on my motorcycle channel and my photography channel. What if we do something kind of fun with some humor and but really factual and make some of these facts super shocking? And uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. And uh, hopefully I don't age out of it, you know. Maybe I can do it for 10, 20 more years. Yeah, yeah, I think you can. It's and uh, I recommend everybody go because um, there's a lot about the carnivore diet and debunking um, a lot of the uh, mm -hmm. myths around keto and the low carb, all sorts of things you talk about. So really, and the videos are terrific. So, you know, the they, last one I did <clears throat> um, was on a supplement sales guy. So the best way to sell supplements is to go start a YouTube channel. You can get unthinkably rich doing that. Dr. Marcola, Mark Sisson, and so on. I mean, they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Liver King sold a hundred million dollars in supplements his first year because mm. it, you, and you don't have to go you know, through he's Amazon. A liar. He's a liar that li yeah, liver. Yeah. King. I do yeah. have heard of him. <laughs> well, I think most of them are, um, but just not I quite. Know, I know bold. Mark Sisson personally, and I haven't, uh, he's a triathlete and, yeah. um, he got fourth place at the world championships back in the day. Yeah. He's, he's an, an amazing runner, but, um, he's a really good guy. I don't know mm -hmm. much about his philosophy, but he's very good. And he's, he's a, a good person. I, I do yeah. think he believes, believes what mm -hmm. he's selling. I don't know exactly what his supplements, but I do believe, I do know that he believes that low carb is great. Mm -hmm. There are people, there are quite a number of people who are like that, who believe it's great. But, you know, if you read Mark's Daily Apple, his blog, um, the misinformation in there is just, you know, it, it just makes you crazy, especially when he talks about things I know a lot about, like earth science. It's like, mm -hmm. well, how can you weigh in on something that crazy about earth science? Mm -hmm. So he may believe it, but... I mean, he sold his supplements company to Kraft Foods for $200 million. He'd only been running it for four years. That has to affect you a little bit. So. So anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. So you, your last video. Oh yeah. My last video was uh, from a guy who has a master's in nutrition science, but he's been a supplement salesman his whole life very, very popular. Um, and he's selling all these high-end supplements like berberine and so on. And, you know, it could be that he he's like Mark Sisson and he thinks it's the right thing to do. Uh, but just following the trail of facts on things like berberine, it doesn't look good. And I don't like to do those episodes because I feel like, ugh, what awful person would, you know, debunk somebody else like that. Uh, but I don't make it personal. Um, it's only about the science. And, you know, in all the episodes I've done, I haven't heard, I, you know, I always fear before I press the publish button that I got something wrong and they can call me out for it. And if you get one thing wrong, then they can say, well, if you got this wrong, then you can't trust anything he says. So I fear that every single time, which makes me take a lot longer to do these episodes because I have to do all the fact checking. Sometimes I share it with people who really know before I publish it. But I haven't seen anybody call me out for, you know, I mean, one guy is Ben Bickman, who's a professor at BYU. And he makes some very startling statements. Uh, BYU is a Mormon university. They have this health code written in the 1830s. Uh, that meat should be eaten sparingly, and it's pleasing to me, the Lord, that it be eaten not at all, except maybe in times of famine. Um, and uh, but he says that's not a diet, even though it seems quite specific. And he's moved Mormonism towards very high meat, and he makes very provocative statements online. We're not herbivores. You can't be a vegan and be healthy, but you can be a carnivore and be healthy. So I did an episode on him, and it's got like eighty thousand views, and I just 
you know, said, well, here's what he said. Let's take a look and see if that's if that's true. Um, for example, at BYU, at Brigham Young University, in front of the student body, he made the statement um, that um, the leaders of the church have never spoken about diet except for exceptionally harmful and addictive substances, alcohol, cigarettes, and so on. Well, he's at Brigham Young University, so I pulled up what Brigham Young had to say when he was president of the church, speaking to the General Conference, which is today on the church's website. And what Brigham Young had to say is, if you want to know what the Lord's word is for Mormons for what to eat, never eat any a pig. I know it like Moses knew it, no swine. And he said, beef is as healthy a food. He said this in the 1860s. Beef is as healthy a food as we need right now, but not stall-fed beef. That has a different character. Only grass-fed beef from the mountains. But if you want to know a diet that's really healthy, it's fruits and vegetables and fish from our mountain streams. And with that, you have a completely healthy diet. That's what he actually said. So, uh, you know, when you put that in an episode, who's how can anybody... So I try to come up with those kind of facts that are just irrefutable. It's not me getting emotional or anything. It's just me doing, you know, detective work, checking the facts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where can people find you and Plant Chompers? Uh, my YouTube channel's called Plant Chompers. <laughs> I just search for Plant Chompers. In fact, I think the domain even has Plant Chompers in the name. And I've got, I have the Earl plant chompers.com and it directs to the YouTube channel. So, but I'm on Twitter at plant chompers quite active there. I'm on Instagram at plant chompers. Um, I'm my own name on LinkedIn. I'm not very active there. It's not called Twitter anymore. <laughs> oh, is it called, called X? X? <laughs> oh, I miss, I miss that cute little bird. I thought that was such brilliant branding. Oh Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for being on oh, the thank show, Chris. You. You've been terrific. So many great stories full of, once again, entertaining and informational, just like your website, um, your, your YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.